Are we on Seattle Channel yet? You can begin when, yes, you can begin whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm sorry, Monica. I didn't realize that we were live. Okay, so we will, um, good Our morning. The March 30th, 2020 Council Briefing Meeting will come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Juarez. Council Member Lewis. Here. Council Member Morales. Here. Council Member Mosqueda. Here. Council Member Peterson. Here. Council Member Sawant. Here. Council Member Strauss. Present. <coughs> Council Member Herbold. Here. Council President Gonzalez. Here. Eight present. Uh, thank you. If there is no, um, excuse me. Yeah, if there is no objection, wait a minute here. I think I have, nope, that's correct. If there is no objection, the minutes of March 2nd and 23rd, 2020 will be adopted. Uh, hearing no objection, the minutes are adopted. Uh, we'll also go ahead and um, approve today's agenda. If there's um, no objection, today's agenda will be adopted. Okay, hearing no objection, today's agenda is adopted. I will go ahead and go through um, President's report just really quickly. Um, so good to see your faces. I'm really glad that we were able to get um, the technology in place to be able to do video conferencing. I think it makes it a little bit easier to, um, to do our business via telecommuting. So really appreciate your all's flexibility and willingness to participate in the video. Um, option. I'm sure many of us had to clean up our little corners of the house to make it look presentable during this um, self-isolation quarantine period of time, but I want to thank you all for um, participating. Secondly, um, just wanted to flag that I sent out to the entire legislative department in a memo updating the uh, legislative department's uh, telecommuting um, policy. Uh, in that memo, it states that we will continue to telecommute through April 24th. That's a Friday. Of course, that date could either be extended. Um, I suspect it will not be shortened, but it will certainly could be extended beyond April 24th. I'll continue to work with our regional partners and with our um, uh uh, executive department, et cetera, to sort of reevaluate that date as uh, time evolves and as more information comes around related to uh, COVID-19 and, um, and uh, how we are doing in terms of flattening the curve. Uh, that memo also includes a reminder about resources that are available to employees throughout the legislative department. I included a link in there. Um, I know that right now can be a really stressful period of time uh, for folks who are having a hard time with isolation and quarantining and socially distancing in addition to physically distancing. There are resources available to our employees. Uh, I just wanna make sure that council members are also um, reminding their staff that those resources are available. Uh, lastly, I also included a, a memorandum that we received from uh, Seattle Department of Human Resources, Director Bobby Humes. Uh, the city of Seattle on the executive side has established a protocol and policy for daily self-assessments of COVID-19 symptoms for all employees who are uh, showing up and being physically present at city facilities, including city hall. Uh, I want uh, th these recommendations were included as an attachment to the email. They are uh, voluntary, uh, but they are strongly recommended guidelines that our um, employees and visitors are being asked to uh, comply with consistent with Washington State Department of Health 
um, recommendations. Um, secondly, I, I wanted to give folks a quick quick update on some of the work my office is doing related to House Bill 6201. That's a bill that was passed by our state legislature on March 18th that requires and will require the city of Seattle and other uh, public uh, employers to provide additional paid sick leave and expanded paid family medical leave to employees for qualifying COVID related reasons. Uh, we are working with SDHR to finalize the policy uh, decisions and administration of those new leave requirements by the deadline, which is April 2nd of 2020. So once we have a better sense of what those uh, paid sick leave additional requirements will be for public employers like us, we'll go ahead and make sure to share those with um, the entire legislative department. And uh, we wanna make sure, of course, that all of our uh, staff all of the legislative staff, including those uh, staff members in our office, have uh, the information they need and the access they need to additional paid sick leave for COVID-related um, reasons. So we'll make sure to keep you all updated on that. The, the, the third and last thing I'll report on uh, related to the president's report um, is related to the introduction referral calendar and to um, a proclamation that we received from the governor's office related to uh, legislation um, that we can consider given the the uh, changes to the Open Public Meeting Act. Um, so just really quickly on the introduction and referral calendar, I want to um, encourage folks uh, on the um, uh, call today to be mindful of um, of when of the timing of when you are asking the council president's office and the city clerk's office and council central staff to um, so to uh, put items on the introduction referral calendar last Friday, we saw a flurry of uh, four to five uh, last minute requests coming in as late as 2.30 p.m. on Friday. And that creates a huge amount of burden for um, the clerk's office and council central staff in terms of making sure that we are uh, fulfilling our quality control processes and also making sure that we comply with the governor's new proclamation as um, as currently being interpreted. So for those folks who haven't seen the proclamation by the uh, governor's office, there is some language in there that seems to imply that the only type of legislation that we are allowed to consider um, currently uh, without, because we don't currently have public comment, is legislation that is routine and or related directly to the COVID-19 emergency response. We are working with a law, law department to um, uh, get additional guidance and clarification from the Attorney General's office uh, to make sure that we have a full and clear understanding of what the proclamation is. Obviously, it's going to make it very difficult for us as a city council to continue doing uh, you know, basic services and uh, legislation required to deliver basic services if we um, aren't, if we are so severely limited in terms of what legislation we can actually consider. So stay tuned for more information on that, but really just want to remind folks that, um, you know, it takes the clerk's office about 48 hours to review legislation and to make sure that it's up to par with quality um, and to our professional standards. And so just really want to make sure that you all are, are um, uh, being conscientious of, of uh, those uh, limitations and and restrictions on our legislative staff so i know that this is um uh unique circumstances and that sometimes um sometimes there can be exceptions to this rule but i'd really like for us to work hard to um, try to be proactive and to have enough advance notice as we are considering referring things to the introduction and referral calendar so um, and then the last thing that I will say is that I um, am really grateful to the governor's office uh, for reaching out to my office and to um, council member Claudia Balducci's office over at King County to institute a weekly call to provide us direct information and access to the governor's office to be able to get updates about uh, the state's emergency response and ways that we can uh, collaborate. I wanna offer to all of you as my colleagues um, an opportunity to um, communicate directly with me and provide me with any side of sort of questions um, or concerns or issues that you want me to flag for the governor's office. Uh, we usually uh, meet at the end of the week, either mm -hmm. on Thursday or Friday. So just want to provide that as an opportunity to um, all of my colleagues so that we can uh, coordinate um, that uh, type of information. So 
that is that is all for the council president's report. I'm happy to take any questions or hear any comments. Okay, hearing none, we'll go ahead and um, start the presentation. So, um, President Gonzalez, I did I did have a comment. Oh, sure, Councilmember Salant. Uh, I uh, in 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 the phone check-in that you and I did, I had emphasized that we we do need to mm -hmm. uh, make every effort for public comment. And I say this, knowing that our staff, especially our tech staff, have been doing an incredible job. And I, I this is not uh, I just want that want them to know this is not a uh, not something that is directed at them, but at the council as a body that we have to try and get public comment in, because even if it is. Um, it is legislation related to coronavirus. I think it is, uh, and, and especially so, I think it is important to have public input. And so I just wanted to register once again, my sense of urgency to uh, to address that issue, especially, you know, to your point, we, we don't, we, we've now extended this to April 24th. And as you said, uh, possible that it will be extended, very unlikely that it will be uh, um, cut short, you know, that and that will be coming back physically to city council before then. So I just wanted to register that. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Salant. I know that you and I had a really good conversation last week about this issue. Um, we, it, it, in our office, are working with, still committed to trying to see if we can find some sort of technological way to um, allow the public to comment. So there's a, a couple of layers. One is figuring out the interpretation of the governor's proclamation about what kind of legislation we can consider um, as a matter of course during the emergency response. And then secondly, um, you know, figuring out how to reintegrate public comment into that period. It's unclear to me whether um, uh, public comment via phone or video will um, allow us to consider any legislation that is not emergency response related based on some language that we're reading in the proclamation. But we, um, we, are, we are actively looking for other examples of how uh, both here locally and abroad, people are addressing the public comment issue. So um, I know that the Port of Seattle has figured out how to, or they're testing ways to make sure that they can hear from the pub public. Um, so we're looking at those examples and, and hoping to be able to uh, come up with some sort of resolution so that we can reintegrate public comment. Any other questions or comments from folks? Okay. Um, why don't we go ahead? Did I'm I hear sorry, from Council President? Um, Hi. Council Member Mosqueda. Hi. Um, I just want to let you know I'm going to be on audio at about 1020. And um, if I don't get a chance to do my audio, I mean, my presentation before I uh, go into audio, uh, perhaps uh, Council Member Herbold, as my vice chair, could read my report if that's possible. Yep, that's fine. I know that several folks um, have to leave the call early. I know that the um, Office of Intergovernmental Affairs reached out to all of us last night with an offer to tour the new U.S. Army um, uh, uh, Field Hospital at Century Link. Really grateful for the opportunity for us as uh, elected officials to be able to tour that facility. And I know that some of you all are going to have to get off the call to take advantage of that um, important opportunity to look at this uh, public health facility at CenturyLink. So appreciate that heads up, Councilor Mosqueda. All right, so let's, why don't we move into the third agenda item, which is the presentation of the condition of the West Seattle Bridge. Um, I believe we have our presenters online, which include uh, Sam Zimbabwe, who is the director of SDOT, Lori Lai Williams, Matthew Donahue, and Adam Emery, all with the Seattle Department of Transportation. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over and um, have the um, uh, department give us a presentation. Unless Council Member Peterson or Herbal, do you have some introductory remarks you want to make before the presentation starts? If, if I could, I just have a couple of, um, of introductory remarks. I'll make it really quick. Go, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank um, SDOT for um, their uh, quick agreement to participate in this briefing. Um, as you can imagine, uh, constituents in District 1 were really shocked at the short notice um, of the closure. There's universal support um, for the fastest action possible uh, for West Seattle. This is a second emergency layered upon the uh, COVID-19 emergency. Um, and I, for me, the key questions are, 
how long is the upper bridge going to be usable? What can the council do to assist the quick, quickest action possible? Um, whether or not that's funding or permitting assistance. We need to know how long it's gonna to take to complete the repairs. Um, and if we don't know now, when will we have an estimate? Um, and um, also getting a sense of how much work that SDOT is doing uh, right now. And I also wanna thank, um, thank SDOT for its quick response to the many um, requests for uh, traffic mitigation, uh, traffic management mitigation measures and the work that they're already doing on putting in a temporary uh, stoplight um, at Highland Park and, um, and Holden because so many, so many of the cars are um, getting off of the, um, the First Avenue Bridge and coming up the hill. So that, that's all I have for right now. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. Uh, Councilmember Peterson is chair of the Transportation Utilities Committee. Are there any introductory remarks you'd like to make before we get started? Yes, I want to let everybody know I, I agree with what Councilmember Herbold is saying. Very concerned about the West Seattle Bridge. And we are going to be putting on today's council agenda actually a resolution adding the West Seattle Bridge to our capital watch list because it's now become an urgent capital project want to make sure it's done thoroughly and quickly. And uh, we'll be setting up additional briefings to keep the public informed about what's going on, not only with the West Seattle Bridge, but also with uh, key bridges throughout our city because it raises questions about the inspections and process for bridges throughout our city. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Peterson. So I'm gonna hand it over to Director Zimbabwe to go ahead and get the presentation started. And for those of you who um, our video conferencing in, there's a little button that you can mute yourself on. So if you're not actively um, speaking, I'd ask that you uh, mute yourself so that we don't hear any um, uh, ambient noise to interrupt the presentation. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you and, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. I know this is a really challenging time for all of us in terms of having an open and, and transparent public dialogue about this really important issue. Uh, and I, I thank you for giving us the opportunity to have this platform uh, to, to do so. Um, Matt, Adiam, and I are all in separate locations right now as well. And so we're gonna be managing on our side as well as we can across this, this um, this time to be able to present to you all of this information. I would also suggest, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions. We've got a lot of information that we're gonna to try to present as quickly as possible. If folks can use the chat function in, uh, in here, we'll be able to proactively be able to answer some of those questions and be prepared to do so as quickly as possible since I know some folks have to get off uh, the call as well. Uh, so we recognize that this has become as a, as a real shock at a time when there are a lot of stressors in everybody's lives. Uh, we have uh, lots of people who are, who are doing the extraordinary on a daily basis, uh, and this is adding to the challenges that they face in terms of getting around for those essential things that they need to get around. Uh, we empathize with those residents, uh, with, with you, the council, uh, and, and wanna emphasize that this was not an easy decision or a decision that we take lightly. Uh, we will continue to communicate regularly with accuracy, with transparency, and be flexible as the conditions change on the ground and as we make changes and, and as, as we have new information to share. Uh, since last Monday, we've been providing almost daily updates to the public and to the media. We've stood up a website, uh, uh, www.seattle.gov slash transportation slash West Seattle Bridge and mobilized our community engagement team to listen and respond to questions from the public. Uh, from our work in West Seattle of late, um, uh, our ability to engage this community is well in place. Um, above all else, I want to convey that the Seattle Department of Transportation does not take chances when it comes to public safety. That's why we closed the West Seattle Bridge, uh, uh, high-rise bridge on March 23rd, last Monday, all traffic. We hope today's discussion makes three things clear. First and again, safety is our top priority, full stop. Second, the rapid announcement to close the high bridge uh, came as a result of our ongoing and close monitoring of the conditions of the bridge. We regularly inspect our bridges, uh, and since 2013, we've inspected our bridge, uh, West Seattle High Bridge at least once a year and well above the every two years federal standard. You'll hear that the design life of the bridge uh, was intended for construction, of, uh, construction to, uh, the construction for the bridge to last 
uh, for 75 years. Um, during the, the added inspections over the last several years, there was no indication at, over the, the course of that time that the bridge was unsafe for ordinary use and that remediation would affect the normal, the, nor, the normal use of that. The preventative maintenance that we've done over the past few years uh, did not indicate that there would be any change um, to the normal use of the bridge. Uh, Matt will talk a little bit more about what has changed and what's evolved over the last few months and, uh, and even a few weeks uh, to lead us to this, this decision uh, that came on, on all of us uh, very quickly, despite the diligence that we've shown in inspecting and maintaining uh, this bridge. Um, third, this issue is absolutely top of mind. For me, a key priority of SDOT, for Mayor Durkin, uh, for all of us to work, and we'll talk a little bit more about what we've done already in the last week to put in place um, the, the project team to be able to, to accomplish all of what we're talking about uh, very quickly. So um, do you have the, you were, okay, so we're sharing this, the, the presentation. Uh, we'll, we're gonna go through um, uh, our, our uh, we're gonna go through a, an overview uh, very quickly. Uh, we want to emphasize that all of our infrastructure ages. Usually it does so in a predictable fashion that enables us to prepare for major maintenance or replacement uh, and set up project teams, communication, outreach to the public. And there are very few surprises. We have had some, We've had, we have a lane closed on the 4th Avenue Bridge uh, over Argo. Last, late last year, WashDOT had to do emergency repairs on the Aurora Bridge that, that changed traffic patterns very quickly. Uh, when these infrastructure changes happen, when, things, when, when conditions warrant, we take swift and decisive action to maintain public safety. We know that often comes as a shock. Uh, we, we, there's, there's, um, when those things become apparent, when we have to take that action, we have to do so with the utmost care. We like to do these things in a very planned and deliberate fashion. The viaduct closure last year is a good example. It's also a similar level of traffic impact, a similar level number of vehicles that are using, that are using that uh, structure every day. Um, we did briefing after briefing, over 40 joint community briefings, press events, other communications around the viaduct closure that were, were possible because it was happening in a more predictable way, there, was a, there were many years of discussion about what to do about the viaduct as a whole. Uh, for, for reasons that we don't yet know about what's happening with the West Seattle Bridge, we, had, we were given hours to do what we previously had months or even years to do in the case of the viaduct. So we recognize that this has been uh, a huge level of impact at a time when people have uh, all sorts of other things that are concerning for them in their, in their lives. Uh, we needed to take this action swiftly and decisively to maintain public safety and maintain the asset of the bridge and, and minimize the need for repairs overall. So uh, with that, we'll go to the next slide. This is just a brief overview, and I know I'm gonna try to keep an eye on time, um, but we're gonna go through some of the, the uh, inspection and maintenance history, our decision to close, our short-term uh, recommendations and what we're doing right now, what we've done and where we're going from the traffic impacts, where we think we're going from our repair options, a little bit about what we're doing to communicate and then how we're organizing ourselves within FSTOT and then where we see as next steps. We'll try to do that as quickly as possible again um, and then be able to answer questions. I know uh, the chat function may not be effective in terms of, of uh, maintaining the public dialogue. so. Feel free to interrupt us if, if you need to and ask questions as we go as well. Director Zimbabwe. Um, yes. So, so uh, we've been told that we should not use the chat yes. function um, at all because we need to make sure that that uh, we're maintaining an appropriate public record of questions being asked. So I would ask uh, council members if you do want to ask a question, um, either either jump on in or use the chat function to tell me that you have a question so that I can um, interrupt uh, um, the presentation and allow questions um, to, to be asked. So uh, let's try to make, we are all learning how to do this video conferencing uh, together for the first time. So hopefully we can um, uh, make it productive and still be orderly. So just a reminder, don't use uh, the chat to ask questions, but if you have a question, 
um, I have the chat feature open uh, on my computer. And if you just say, I have a question, I will interrupt the presentation to allow you to, to, to ask your question. Okay, and with this, I'm gonna mute myself. Matt is gonna talk about the next few items about the inspection. Uh, Adiam is gonna talk about the traffic management impacts and mitigations. Matt will come back to talk about repair options and then I'll close it out from the communications on down. So Matt, take it away. Thank you, Sam. Good morning, everybody. So a bit of background on this bridge. It was built in 1980 or uh, opened for use in 1984, July of 1984. And it was one of the two bridges that were built to replace the old green bascule bridges that you can see in the lower left-hand corner after one of them was hit by a freighter uh, in 1978. Um, so in the upper right-hand uh, section of the photo, you, this is actually a construction photo from when they were building the high rise you can see that it is two uh, cast in place segmental box, concrete box girder bridges. So it's basically a reinforced uh, concrete uh, bridge um, comprised of two very large box beams with a, a monolithic slab that ties across the top of those beams. Um, so some, a few things to note as we get into the defects and the deterioration that we found in our inspection program and how and why that concerned us versus normal wear and tear for a bridge concrete reinforced concrete bridges are uh, to some extent made to crack. Um, so we anticipate that concrete will crack over time and we pr uh, perform design calculations and construct the bridge to accommodate that. Um, I, no one in particular me is the bridge manager for the city and as a you know, professional engineer and a certified bridge inspector likes to see any kind of atypical deteriorations. So we're typically very careful to find any deterioration and then quantify it. Um, to make sure we understand that it's the normal deterioration in a structure that you would expect versus something different. A um, couple of the things to note about this bridge, it's very unique uh, in terms of the span lengths and its overall height. Um, it's built essentially uh, for our topography and geography to get up from the Duwamish River and then up into West Seattle to the, uh, up on the hill to the Alaska Junction. Um, it is, uh, was originally designed for three lanes of traffic in either direction uh, and albeit cl uh, closed currently, it has four lanes of traffic in the eastbound direction and three lanes of traffic in the westbound direction. Um, so next slide, please. So a few comments on how we got here today and what our inspection program has looked like over the last several years. Uh, every bridge on the national highway system uh, and monitored by the FHWA, state DOT, and then down to uh, city asset owners like us, is required to be inspected above water every 24 months, every two years. So in 2013, we had a routine inspection for this bridge, and that was the first time we noticed atypical cracking beyond what you would normally expect for this bridge type. Uh, and it triggered right away um, a close eye in that we hired a consulting engineering firm here in Seattle to work with us in 2014 to study this bridge and see if we could determine at that point what was causing this atypical cracking. And the results of that study weren't particularly conclusive. They recommended or pointed out a number of things that could be causing it, but the recommended action was to continue to inspect on a more regular frequency. So at least every year, instead of every two years and to also um, monitor the bridge. And so that same year we installed crack width gauges uh, with a, a consulting firm that does that sort of work that link back to a website so that we can monitor that data uh, real time. Uh, and so that instrumentation was put at each one of the four distinct um, or unique cracking locations that we'd observed. So Matt, we can, can I ask you to can I ask you to pause? Um, Councilmember Herbold has indicated she has a question. Councilmember Herbold, the floor is yours. Uh, you're on mute still. Um, I'd like to actually hold my question until after we go through this through the um, the rest of the slide. I'm sorry for alerting you. Um, I, I have a question, but after we go through the rest of the slide. Okay, so Thank Matt, you. once you are done speaking about this slide, can you pause to allow Councilmember Herbold to ask her a question? Yes, I can. Great, thank you. So through uh, from 2014 to 2019, we continued to uh, perform our annual inspections and look at the crack, crack width gauge data that we were getting um, on a regular basis. And, you know, we, we saw the cracking continue to grow, but not at an alarming or accelerated rate. Um, and you could actually see from the crack gauge with data that the bridge expands, the cracks are active and they expand and contract over time. But the average growth over time was very, very small down to a thousandth of an inch 
or less. Uh, so in 2019, what changed is uh, we also do something that's required by the federal government in addition to inspections called load rating of bridges. And it's a specific calculation, calculation method to look at whether or not the bridge can handle very specific types of truck. Uh, and so those trucks are um, specified in terms of axle spacing and weight by the federal government. Whenever they come out with a new truck that makes it into the load rating program, the federal government comes out with a mandate that says everybody that has this type of bridge or with this type, any type of bridge within a certain distance from the federal highway system, you have to reload rate the bridge for these new trucks. So in 2013, they rolled out new trucks and they gave us until 2022 to do the load rating. Um, we had actually scheduled this bridge for load rating uh, later than 2019, but in 2019, because we still had this cracking issue, we decided to move that load rating up to 2019 because we knew that the way that you can do those uh, calculations for load rating are very specific to the types of defects that you observe. And if you see atypical defects, you're required to do a more advanced analysis. And we knew that was going to take more time. So we bumped it up in the schedule. So two things happened. We had these two parallel lines. We're doing this advanced analysis and load rating starting in 2019. We're continuing to inspect the bridge just because we need to from uh, an inspection program standpoint, but we're also trying to gather more data to feed into the analysis so that we could really define these cra <clears throat> excuse me, crack sections and, re and understand how to accurately analyze them. Ultimately, what we did is we built a large global linear elastic model and then a localized nonlinear model to really dive deep on these crack sections and understand their behavior so that we could do a responsible load rating. As we're gathering data for that analysis, we could see the cracking patterns in the bridge start to change and accelerate. And so by late February, we had gotten to the point where our consultant partner that was working on this with us had recommended going down to two lanes in either direction. And as we were preparing to do that, planning how we would execute that from traffic control standpoint and outreach and then preparing to alert um, you know, the mayor's office and city council and everyone else that needs to know about this, as we were like the day we were having a briefing or just the day before I got a call from our consultant partner and they changed the recommendation from restricting down to two lanes to closure. Uh, and that was on March 19th. So uh, I had a briefing with Sam and other leadership at the DOT on the 20th. We discussed the lane closures and this change in recommendation. And then I spent Friday evening and through the weekend going through and consuming all of that um, information or digesting it. And then made the call made the call to bring my engineering team and our consultant partner up onto the bridge at 9 a.m on monday morning so that brings me to the next slide uh, to the decision to close this is what we saw when we got up there um there's a couple okay, of hold things on, hold on matt oh hold right. on, matt. sorry matt, sorry matt, matt. wants Thank to have you. a question answered now I, I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to, again, raise the issue of notice to the public and, and transparency as really uh, being critical. Um, it's, uh, I, I am of the opinion that is when we moved to uh, monthly inspections, um, that the public and the council should have been uh, notified one really useful way uh, to do that, I believe, is through our uh, our uh, capital projects reports that come to the council. Um, there is actually a, uh, a program uh, related, I believe, to um, the work that you've been doing. Um, there's a bridge load rating uh, CIP project. Um, it would have been really useful if um, in the uh, third quarter report, last year um, we had been notified because I, I the, again the notification process uh, through those those quarterly reports uh, through project review um, is intended to notify the the council of increased risk around uh, particular programs and projects and this is not an as it relates specifically to the bridge load rating it's not a specific project but it is a program and it's a program that you are doing for uh, a number of bridges um, but at the point at which you decided that um, you needed to um, uh, expedite the bridge lo load rating for the West Seattle Bridge and, and you moved to monthly inspections I think it would have been a really uh, useful thing um, as I mentioned earlier there's a 
uh, you know, a really a universal response of, of shock and in some cases uh, anger from constituents um, in, in West Seattle about this. So uh, in, in keeping with our, with our commitment to, to transparency and, and no surprises uh, and, and preparation, um, I would really appreciate um, the um, department to think about how to um, adjust its reporting um, so that we can uh, move towards uh, a culture of, again, no surprises. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Asma. I'll just jump in to respond. I, I, I think we we all we all hear that and, and understand it. I think again, going back to what I said at the very beginning, it wasn't until very very recently that we thought that any of the repair uh, needed for the bridge would change any normal use, use daily traffic patterns on the bridge in terms of what it would take for repair. So I totally hear. Uh, we all hear our, the concern, and, and you know it. it um, are happy to figure out ways to, to make sure we're communicating transparently. If we had started that reporting last fall, it wouldn't have said we think we might need to close the bridge because that wasn't something that we were planning for at that point. Thank you. So um, on this on this slide where it says October, November, December, begin analyzing mitigation options. Closing the bridge was not one of those options that you were considering at that time. Is that is that accurate? That's 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 right. That's right. We were That's mitigation right. meant in terms of how do we mitigate the cracking, not what traffic mitigations need to be done. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that line of questioning. So if if we're looking at this slide, um, which is slide four, sort of at what point in time was um, you know closure to traffic considered as a potential option that would be required to address the cracking? The first time that we received um, an indication from our uh, consultant teaming partner that they were going to recommend going down to two lanes in each direction was February 21st. So then February 21st was the lane reduction under consideration that shows up here. And then, um, and we didn't receive notice until what last last week. That's that's right, and and I think when we got the initial, it was it was not an immediate. This needs to happen tomorrow. Uh, lane restriction, and we started to put together what would um, wh what it would take from a traffic mitigation. What that would start to look like from a traffic management plan uh, perspective, um, because the indication at that point was that this was something we had to seriously consider. Uh, and and but that we didn't have to do that immediately um and uh this was at the same time as as everybody knows this was at the same time as as the department and the city has been responding to COVID 19 and putting a lot of different practices uh practices in, in place and and things like that, that that were also consuming attention that didn't stop our inspection procedures but it did it did make it more difficult to have some of the uh the the preparatory discussions even for what lane lane restrictions would look like so we I, we we totally under, understand the frustration and the concern about this um and and we'll seek to um you know from here forward on this project and on on all projects we seek to have that uh dialogue as early as as we think possible in in um you know, not unduly alarming the public, but also making sure we're we're open and accurate and transparent in our communications with you and, and the public as a whole. I think to Councilmember Herbold's point, um, you know, it, it it was about three to four weeks before the city council um, found out that the lane of reduction in this case, full closure, was going to occur. And we found out just a few hours before the general public found out and our constituents learned that they would no longer have access to the West Seattle Bridge. And so I think that over a period of three to four weeks, there could have been more proactive engagement, certainly of at a minimum, the chair of the Transportation and Utilities Committee and um, the district representative for District 1. And so I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that that proactive engagement did not occur and that um, and that it's it, it took sort of this um, severe action for the department to um, acknowledge that moving forward, it needs to engage city council members 
um, on issues of such significant import. And so I, I, I really, I wanna, um, I understand and appreciate that we're all under pressure, but we still have an obligation to uh, communicate with each other. And I think that that um, obligation is um, escalated and even more serious now and is a little harder to do, which means we have to be much more proactive in figuring out how to engage with each other. And I think all of the council members here I know Councilmember Herbold in particular takes very serious the responsibility to be accountable to our constituents and to communicate transparently, and uh, and I think we, I think the department could have done a better job in engaging um, council members as it relates to this this particular issue. I appreciated the three hours heads up, um, so I didn't find out about it for the first time in the media. But I, I I think we can do better. I know we can do better in terms of how we communicate this kind of critical information with each other. Understood, and again, I don't, I don't want to belabor this point. I, I want to be unequivocal that we are committed to that same level of transparency. The recommendation for closure did not come to us until Friday, March 19th. It wasn't until Matt himself went up on the bridge on Monday morning, March 23rd, uh, or sorry, Thursday, March 19th, Monday, Matt went up on the bridge on March, 20, March 23rd in the morning confirmed what the recommendation was, saw the, the growth, which we'll go into in the next slide. And then uh, from that point, once we have that, that level of recommendation, we can't take the time to brief everybody and make sure we have all plans in place. We have to, to take swift and decisive action. So I, I fully appreciate that there is frustration that we could have had some more discussion in the weeks leading up to it. Um, we, will, we will seek to, to to do that from here on forward with with this there was also at that point not an indication that we had to take such swift action uh to maintain public health and safety so um again i don't want to get too too bogged down in this i think we we have a shared commitment to openness and transparency and a shared commitment to informing uh and and being open and transparent going forward great let's uh let's move along Okay, thank you. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So the decision to close on Monday, um, we saw rapid and unexpected growth in the bridge uh, over the course of days or weeks. Um, and because public safety is the number one priority and for myself as a certified bridge inspector with over 20 years of experience, if you look at the blue lines in that photo, um, you that is growth that occurred between the 5th of March, which was the earliest time in March that I was in the bridge and the 23rd when we went out to see the bridge. That type of growth in a reinforced concrete, concrete structure is completely unacceptable. That's typically the type of growth you see over years, not over weeks and days. And so that drove me primarily as a bridge inspector and the ma bridge manager for the city to pick up the phone from inside the girder in the bridge and call Lorelei and my deputy director to alert Sam that we needed to close the bridge that day. Um, that that caused extreme concern with remaining, leaving live load or vehicular live load on the bridge uh, of a risk to public safety. So we have a graphic here that shows that progression over months um, and, then, and then weeks towards the end of it. The other thing to note here is that in, in the structural bridge world, Angular cracks like that are at a diagonal are called shear cracks. That type of deterioration in a bridge will go until failure and then failure happens typically quickly and without warning as opposed to other type of cracking that's not oriented in that way. So that exacerbates the concern at this point that it's a failure mechanism that could happen very, very quickly without you know the bridge deforming or, or changing shape before it actually gives way uh, in addition to the rate of that crack growth. So if we could go on to the next slide. So what are we gonna do about it? Short-term recommendations for the high pass, uh, we are, uh, are and are gonna continue to take all steps to maintain the integrity of the structure. Um, and we need to return the bridge to normal operations as soon as possible. Um, we are going to, uh, when we do those repairs, we're gonna see if we can do it in a way that returns some traffic to the bridge ahead of uh, going back to full operations. Um, the part of the maintaining of the integrity, of course, was to restrict traffic, but we will be up there weekly continuing to inspect these cracks, 
uh, to make sure that um, what we think now that the bridge uh, can't handle its own dead weight continues to be true. And we've got a suite of instrumentation uh, mechanisms and techniques that will not only help us monitor the bridge, but help us gather early data uh, for how the mechanics of these crack sections actually work to help us start thinking about design or repairs even before we actually start the design process. Um, and for back to the design process, you know, we're looking at uh, different alternative methods like design build or GCCM as a way to accelerate the design process and cut down on lead time for materials, which can become an issue. Next okay, slide. great. Just, just before you move on, Matt, we have um, three uh, council members in the queue. Uh, we're going to hear first from council member Morales, and then we will hear from council member Peterson, and then uh, council member Herbold also has a question. So council member Morales, you uh, have the floor. Thank you. Um, so when you were saying that the um, that that graphic you showed seemed pretty quick the uh, the rate of um, of the cracks expanding um, it makes me wonder if there's any way for you to know uh, if that sudden disaster happens what the timeline for that might be but the reason I ask that is because if we're if we're still allowing people on the lower bridge um, and there is a chance that the upper bridge might collapse at any moment. I'm worried that we're still putting people at risk if they are using the under bridge to get across. Uh, so excellent points and observation. Um, we, we don't think uh, that there is a risk that the bridge could collapse at any moment. Uh, we think that the bridge is currently stable, particularly because we took live load for vehicles off of it. Um, but because of the cost of being wrong about that, we're going to continue to monitor the bridge to make sure that we're right. Um, Mayor Durkin very astutely pointed out in our briefing to her last Monday that, that those same points and asked us to expedite modeling of failure mechanisms to see if the bridge did go to failure, what would happen, and to come up with an emergency response plan so that if we started to see behaviors we don't like, that we knew exactly in stepped fashion how to quickly mitigate risk for any uh, infrastructure or people that uh, – currently work around the bridge. Our own bridge, the low bridge, the railroad bridge to the south, Harbor Freight, the light industrial complex on the south end of Harbor Island. So uh, we began working on that last week. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Peterson, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, I would like to echo the comments and concerns raised by Council Member Herbold and Council President Gonzalez about notification. And to put a, a finer point on that, when there is a, a recommendation from an engineer for lane reductions, that we would like to have the immediate notification for that as well, so that it, we can have a rapid discussion on how to communicate to our constituents about that, because lane closures are something that sound very serious, should, should be taken seriously and communicated with that level of seriousness to our constituents if we do need to close lanes on several of the bridges throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Peterson. Uh, we have Council Member uh, Herbold who also has a question. So Council Member Herbold, the floor is yours. And you might be on mute. Yes, Council thank Member you. The, um, the bullet point that references um, the goal of seeking interim repairs with a goal of restoring some traffic. Um, are you suggesting that there might be a possibility of adding a lane back at some point before a more general reopening? That's correct. Um, we won't really be able to determine that until we get down into the weeds on the shoring design that has to happen first but um, we are going to take that lens to see what we can return in a stepped fashion along the way to full operations. And um, related uh, to, the, to the following bullet point around accelerating major maintenance and repair to extend the bridge life, can you talk a little bit more? You'd mentioned um, design build approaches. Can you talk a little bit more about what, what sort of options would allow you to um, uh, accelerate the, the repair to uh, not only extend the bridge life, but also to um, ad address the need to uh, restore traffic as soon as possible. Sure, the, the classic method for delivering, um, say, a capital structural project is design, bid, build. So you go through the entire design process, then you put it out for bid, select a contractor, and build it. 
there are other ways to do that where you have the designer of record and a contractor or constructor of the repairs working hand in hand earlier in the process to cut down on difficulties um, in construction that weren't really realized in the design process. Yes, thank you. Um, I understood the um, that process. I was asking um, if there are other strategies beyond beyond that process because I, I, I believe the design build um, contracting process is fairly fairly standard these days and uh, I might be wrong on that, but I, it seems like this um, requires some uh, extraordinary out of the box uh, thinking to um, move this work forward as quickly as possible. So one of the things uh, to that point, one of the things that we're already trying to do is combine or really look at how we're doing monitoring for the safety of the bridge to combine that with gathering the stress and strain data um, and how the bridge currently carries its own weight um, as a way to get ahead of design. I mean, typically that's not something you would start until you, just, you began the design, official design process. We're already doing that now. Thank you. Um, I would just like to throw out that given um, the fact that um, we have 17,000 folks who travel the bridge via transit every day um, and another 100,000 uh, vehicles um, that we should really look to see whether or not there are um, still um, additional strategies um, that we can consider. Um, this is like I, I mentioned earlier, um, truly an emergency for uh, uh, West Seattle commuters. Um, and I just would like to see whether or not there are um, extraordinary um, approaches that could be used to address these extraordinary circumstances. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just jump in. I, I think that there, we're, we're looking for any possible way to get uh, to, to return bridge to normal operations as quickly as possible, to restore any amount of traffic as quickly as possible. We will not do that until it is safe to do so. And we will also not go out of step in terms of uh, making decisions that end up uh, putting us in a difficult position to, to do so safely and successfully. So I we, we are right there with you in terms of getting things done as quickly as possible and looking for all the possible ways to accelerate this process. We will be happy to have that conversation as we go forward. Uh, but I also wanna be very clear that we're not gonna make decisions that end up, you know, putting ourselves in financial risk and uh, risk of not being able to successfully make those repairs in, the, in, in trying to be expedient over being prudent. That was uh, that was not my my suggestion. I appreciate you um, you clarifying that. Um, I'm speaking to treating this like an emergency, um, as well as um, as it relates to uh, the contracting processes that were that were discussed before. Um, and um, appreciate obviously that we we need to move forward in in a way that is responsible and prudent, prudent and bounded by, um, by concerns around public safety. So thank you. Absolutely, we share that. All right, let's go ahead and move along. Next slide, please. Uh, so to a previous comment, uh, we also are uh, looking at the swing bridge very carefully. Um, we've had some ongoing issues that we've been addressing over the past uh, months. Um, just in a normal course of asset preservation for this bridge. But now, of course, it's got a laser focus on it uh, because it is the primary bypass route from the high pass for uh, commercial freight, emergency responders, and transit. So things that we're doing uh, right now and will continue to do are weekly inspections and monitoring of particular areas of this bridge as it, it continues to be more heavily loaded with traffic. Uh, we coincidentally, uh, several weeks or a few months ago, began, began a load rating project for this bridge and the approaches on either side. So we're gonna bring that to a close. We've had problematic pedestrian gates that need to move and lock in a particular sequence in an opening cycle that we've had problems with. So those things have a particular long lead time. We ordered them towards the end of last year, uh, recently received those, and we have a, a maintenance installation plan for that coming up in a couple weeks in April. Um, we also have an ongoing capital project for the control system to replace uh, the control system for that bridge. And if some of you may remember in 2018, we had an outage of the Pier 6 or Western side, uh, the pier that's in this photo, 
lift cylinder uh, went out on us, and so we had to pull it out, put in our spare cylinder, and we're bringing uh, a, a forensic analysis and rehabilitation program for that cylinder and the currently still in service Pier 7 cylinder uh, this year. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll turn it over to Adia Memory uh, for the traffic management plan. Thank you, Matt. Um, in regards to traffic, the level of effort and complexity of closing West Seattle Bridge is uh, very similar to the viaduct, if not more complicated. Those two infrastructures carry the same amount of um, average daily traffic, um, the viaduct being 100,000 and West Seattle 84,000. Um, with the viaduct, we had ample time to develop strategies uh, to partner with our uh, partnering agencies to have um, trip reduction or enhance our tra uh, transit uh, routes and so forth, or um, inform the public in also participating in minimizing their trips. Um, with West Seattle, we didn't have that luxury. We, as stated uh, prior, we implemented an emergency closure a week ago, um, um, a week ago, in within five hours. And uh, one of the things that uh, we understand that, you know, West Seattle um, has very limited um, crossing points of the waterway, First Avenue South Bridge being um, the infrastructure that can address or handle a lot of the reroutes. Um, and the north end of West Seattle, uh, we have Lower Spokane Bridge with very, very limited capacity, 20,000 being the maximum capacity that it can handle, which uh, actually translates to a stop and go traffic if we allow about 20,000 people to, to, um, to utilize Lower Spokane Bridge. Hence, we've uh, limited uh, the usage of Lower Spokane Bridge for emergency responders, um, transit and freight to make sure that we are not impeding emergency vehicles response rate and so forth to West Seattle residents. Um, we're redirecting currently everyone um, uh, to South Park. We're also being um, aware and uh, cautious about where we are redirecting this traffic, making sure that we have proper mitigation. Um, so we've expedited um, a signal to be built at Highland Parkway and Holden. Um, I'm happy to announce that it is operational. It was turned on yesterday, so it's operating right now. We're making sure that we are adding um, more traffic count stations, uh, making sure that um, we're data driven as we assess our mitigation approach moving forward, not forgetting out South Park residents and making sure that um, neighborhood streets such as South Park is not inundated with the traffic impact. So we'll continue to mitigate and um, strategize um, with how we manage this traffic. Next slide, please. Before, before you move on, uh, Council Mer Member Herbold has indicated she has a question about this slide. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna uh, just repeat my earlier thanks for your uh, quick action to um, install the temporary uh, traffic signal at Highland Parkway and Southwest Holden. Um, as it relates specifically to um, uh, monitoring the traffic count. Um, thank you for um, adding traffic count stations. I'm interested to know um, how frequently you will have reports on those, um, on those traffic counts um, and what your plan is to share that information um, with uh, particularly myself and uh, Transportation Chair Peterson, um, and then just because I, I'm really interested to to know um, as new traffic patterns develop, how quickly you might be able to consider um, adjusting access. Um, you've you've made a commitment that um, you um, are making those decisions on a data based. Um, uh, approach and I just I want to understand a little bit more with some uh, additional granularity how how frequently um, you will be monitoring those traffic patterns um, and in particular I want to put another plug in I'm, I'm hearing a lot from um, our healthcare workers um, who are um, 
you know, they're nurses, firefighters, police officers, uh, EMTs. They're working a lot of overtime. Um, they're not taking public transit um, so that they can stay, uh, be more more likely to stay stay healthy as they're um, driving to their jobs. And I'm really hoping that, of course, w bounded by uh, principles of, of, of public safety, um, that there is a, an approach, a traffic mitigation approach that allows um, the consideration of the expansion of the lower level bridge for some of those workers. Okay, I'll be happy to take, so uh, where we have currently traffic counts is at the lower Spokane Bridge, in which we'll, we can report on a daily basis. The first influx that we saw after the closure on a Tuesday, we saw at 15,000 um, crossing at Lower Spokane, which really stressed um, the emergency responders. And we heard a lot about from our partnering agency, like responders to say, this is, um, it's not reliable. So we wanna make sure that the restriction on Lower Spokane continues. But again, um, as you stated, we will be data driven. And if there are opportunities in which to open it up, maybe in the late, late evening and so forth if there are capacity we will continuously consider those things um the new added data points once we have them in place we'll be very happy to report out um, daily or weekly and in terms of analysis from engineering perspective we're utilizing those data to um, tweak our signal timing adjust other things continuously on a daily basis um, that being said i want to kind of stress the level of the lower Spokane bridge. Clearly it's the closest to the north end of the West Seattle bridge in terms of the waterway crossing, but keeping it um, available and, and uh, reliable for emergency responders, especially in the time that we're in, it's very, very essential. To, so I wanna make sure that we place the restriction for the time in which um, we've restricted it for now. Um, we are keeping um, in mind, uh, keeping our vulnerable users, uh, pedestrians and the bikes and transit in, 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 in mind as we help mitigate and adjust um, um, with all the um, routes where we are directing other traffic to go through. So it's a continuous uh, monitoring and adjustment. Thanks. I'll also just jump in there and say that the, um, that that right now we're in an extraordinary traffic period too you know we've seen massive declines in the in in following the stay home stay healthy order uh people are, are following that and are not traveling in the way that that they uh that they normally would and so right now our traffic we know our traffic levels are very different even with that as adium said when this when in the first couple of days of the closure despite putting in restrictions uh on the lower bridge we saw uh 15,000 people a day or 15,000 vehicles a day uh, using that bridge. And so as if, if and when, when things come back to normal, let's say I'm optimistic that things will be back to normal, hopefully soon from a traffic perspective, we've got to be very careful about uh, not taxing our, our overstressing our infrastructure as well, knowing that there are these impacts. So we're going to, we are very committed again uh, to, to sharing and, and figure out the best ways during the VITA closure, we created dashboards where we were communicating very, you know, on an automated basis, basically what the, what, what traffic impacts were. Um, we're very committed to, to doing the same things. This is, this is unfortunately not going to be a short term issue that we have to deal with and we're going to have to, to figure out ways to share information and adapt as we go forward. That's right. Next slide, please. The detour map indicates uh, was what we stated where the detours are and um, advancing everyone um, to head to um, First Avenue if you're in a um, and then limiting the, the lower Spokane bridge. Um, and here, I just wanna kind of acknowledge like, especially people that live in the north end of West Seattle, we are asking them to travel. We're adding five more miles to their travel time to uh, get back into 99 via First Avenue South. And we recognize that um, it could be a challenge for some, but I think, you know, as Sam stated, uh, when we go back to normal, um, this has, uh, a special request in which like number of trips need to be reduced in order to mitigate this impact that we are seeing um, right now um, with regional you know volume reduction uh, we're not seeing that many impacts but um, 
just the level of you know um, traffic that we're moving on West Seattle Bridge um, on a daily basis of 84,000. Um, it, it, it's going to require a lot of um, strategies and so forth and um, to reduce the number of personal trips that we're making um, moving forward. So next slide, please. This is just kind of reiterating what Sam indicated. Um, we do have, uh, we're planning uh, what the strategies will be as we get back into normal traffic pattern. We do have a task force set for um, King County Metro and the port to strategize and how we handle this um, um, impact that has been um, introduced to our network. Um, uh, and exactly the same level of effort that we've seen in the viaduct, that's the type of level that we anticipate to, to implement moving forward. Um, now I'm gonna pass it on to Matt. Thanks, Adiam. So repair options, what are we gonna do to get this bridge back into service? Uh, first, we need to put in temporary shoring to preserve the structure. Um, and that's primarily uh, to make it safe for a contractor to be on the bridge to do more extensive repairs. Uh, the approach to those repairs, at this point, we think it's likely gonna be uh, carbon fiber wrapping uh, with additional reinforcement at key connections. Uh, for carbon fiber wrapping, is, it's a, a woven carbon fiber mesh that's a fabric that you can lay up onto the bridge and anchor down, and then you coat it with a type of epoxy, and when that hardens up, it forms a shell um, that uh, additionally reinforces or provides more integrity to the bridge. Uh, we'll likely combine that with, um, there is post-tensioning strand or steel strand embedded in the concrete uh, that was tightened up as part of the original construction and locked down. We can still use that technique to put additional post-tensioning strand either inside the hollow part of the girders or on the outside if necessary, depending on how the mechanics of those crack sections ultimately work out. Um, well, as I mentioned before, we're going to look at alternative uh, delivery methods. We also need to be really uh, careful in our design to see if we can do it in such a way that it doesn't impact the box that's around, the theoretical box that's around the federal uh, navigation channel beneath the bridge in the Duwamish. So if you cross into the plane of the horizontal limits of that uh, navigation channel, or if you change the clearance of the bridge, it triggers a federal permit through the Coast Guard uh, that could add a significant time to critical path if we can't stay outside of that box. And I think with the next slide is uh, back over to Sam to talk about communications. Sure. sure. So um, just trying to wrap up here as well. Uh, and thanks everybody for their time on this. Uh, so we, we're, we're going to, we've already talked about our commitment to openness and transparency. We've stood up a website. Uh, we're continuing to share uh, this information. We're, we have an ongoing partnership with Department of Neighborhoods to connect with community and open those feedback channels so that we can problem solve in, in real time with people, uh, and then um, make sure that we keep everybody up to date as, as new information is available, as we have sort of a, a regular rhythm of, uh, of, of information to share, and as we hit, come up upon uh, major milestones. I see that Councilmember Herbold has a question here, so I can hold. Councilmember Herbold, you're yeah, on mute. Yeah. You're on mute. And then after Councilmember Herbold, uh, Councilmember Mosqueda has a question as well. Thank you. Um, so as it relates to communications, I think uh, part of communications also includes uh, making sure that the public understands what the uh, enforcement practices are. So um, if you could just speak to how um, we are planning to enforce the, um, the uh, restriction of the lower level bridge to, uh, to freight, transit, and um, and first responders um, and other uh, populations of, of drivers as, as um, those restrictions are considered for relaxation. Sure, so right now we've got signs out uh, indicating who is permitted to travel and we have um, support from the police department in, um, in, in trying to make sure that, those, that people follow those. Um, we're, we're trying to figure out what the best practice uh, and, and how to best do that. I think uh, we've seen, unfortunately, a lot of people violating those restrictions, which has led to uh, you know, challenges in managing the, the traffic flow. So uh, our general approach 
to enforcement of, of all of our traffic rules is to um, have people uh, follow the, the rules as we set them out and have as light an enforcement touch as possible. Uh, if we can't if we can't get results that we need through that, then we'll have to reevaluate those strategies. Yeah, I, I, but we, but I think I think ultimately, if if we have everybody uh, trying to use the lower bridge, nobody will be able to use the lower bridge. Right, and as you note, um, I think uh, a lot of folks um, are continuing to use the lower lower level bridge. So this is um, an area that I'd like to have some. Um, continuing conversation um, with you about, um, you know, I obviously um, am speaking on, on one hand to the to the interest in, of um, using the lower level bridge uh, for uh, more uh, commuters as is safe um, in the future, but I also have real concerns about the extent to which it's being used now um, in conflict with the current um, the the current restrictions. Absolutely. I think that's also a place where we, we know that some of this, not everybody reads our blog or gets our, our Twitter stream. And so I think some people are used to doing things the way that they're used to doing them. And, and uh, we want to make sure that people are getting information about these restrictions so that they know how to plan their trips to, to make alternatives. But we, it's going to be something that we all need to, to work together as a community to, to make sure we use that, that uh, bridge to the, to the best extent possible. Uh, Councilmember Mosqueda, are you on the line? And uh, if you are, I you am. Got the floor. Thank you, Council President, and uh, thanks to uh, Director Zimbabwe and ESOP for this presentation. Um, uh, just two brief points. One, I just biked into the um, CenturyLink field for this tour, and I'll have to um, leave it to your team to assess the current situation this morning, but I just want to echo the concerns around first responders being stuck in traffic right now and people clearly using that as a shortcut. Um, I hope that some of them are um, medical providers, but uh, it does appear that there's a number of people who are not first responders and not in um a commercial um, transit mobile that would be clogging up the lower bridge and just want to flag that for you. I also echo council member Herbold's point that it'd be a desire to make sure that that is also a viable um, traffic pathway for not just um, healthcare providers, but also those who are human service providers, people providing assistance uh, to our homeless population and to those in permanent supportive housing. Uh, so just want to flag that. Um, and then my question for you uh, was on your second to last slide. You mentioned uh, the way in which we're going to um, try to adhere um, to a quick response of and a long-term response. In our quick response, can you speak to the safety of the workers? What are precautions that we're going to put into place so that we can make sure that, yes, the bridge is a safety hazard if not fixed, but how are we going to keep our workers protected from COVID exposure? Sure. So um, we've already implemented uh, social distancing guidelines for all of our staff and have are, are working with all of our uh, construction sites to implement updated safety plans that take into account uh, health best practices as it relates to COVID exposure. Um, as Matt said, uh, the, the, you know, some of the way that the bridge is built, the hollow uh, nature of the bridge is a pretty tight and enclosed space. And so as we look, look to uh, even installing the, the shoring, we'll need to make sure that we have the ability to, to keep uh, keep the workforce safe that is doing this essential work to get the, the bridge uh, reopened. So none of this is made easier by the public health emergency in which we find ourselves. Um, and uh, we need to keep all of those, those issues front and center as we uh, work on some of these critical infrastructure projects. Thank you, Council President. Um, I, I want to just flag for uh, Director Zimbabwe. I appreciate all the work that you and I have already chatted about in terms of uh, truly essential construction work. I think this is a great example of what's actually essential. And I'm going to continue to um, raise questions about construction that is not essential with other 
projects in our region that have a deadline of 2023. I think my concern remains what is an additional two to four weeks stay to keep our workers protected. I think this is in a different category where obviously um, the safety of our community is at stake. So thanks for your ongoing work um, now and in the future to make sure that we're actually addressing what's essential and letting our construction workers stay home if it's not. I think this is a great example and appreciate your um, protection of worker safety. Council President. Yeah. Who, this who, is Council Member Strauss. Oh, Council Member um, Strauss, please, you have the floor. I, I'm i also just about to enter CenturyLink field with the uh, event center with Council Member Mosqueda, and I want to echo all of her uh, thoughts, which I think are spot on, as well as echoing Council Member Peterson and the uh, appreciation for the fast movement of SDOT to take safety measures as a priority, as well as uh, more, informa more information earlier is always appreciated. And again, just want to highlight, thank you SDOT and to your team for moving quickly to ensure public safety. Thank you, Council Member Strauss. Um, just uh, Director Zimbabwe, I know that we're, we've gone um, quite quite long, um, but I, I do just sort of want to, um, on this slide, which is about the communications plan, um, I really want to put in a plug for um, utilizing our local media to get out as much information as possible to um, people in um, in West Seattle, and to do that through the lens of not just English, but also for um, for our our uh, uh, limited English proficiency or non English proficient populations, of which there are many in West Seattle, both as it relates to detours and staying off of the lower bridge unless you fall into the appropriate population, but also as it relates to traffic impacts and mitigation. So um, District 1 is incredibly diverse as it relates to, to language and, and um, economic position. And I just wanna make sure that we are looking at this through the lens of leveraging uh, local media that is um, you know, really critically important to getting out that information. So in South Park, I know CMAR has uh, strong channels of communication with community members in South Park. Um, and uh, and for, for West Seattle, a lot of folks uh, follow the West Seattle blog. So I'm gonna put in a little plug for our friends over at uh, the West Seattle blog to make sure that, that SDOT is working very closely with them and others. Uh, throughout District 1 to make sure that, that folks really understand what, um, what, uh, what's at stake here and, um, and particularly as it relates to why it's important to um, not just shortcut through the lower um, bridge and, and people need to really understand what's at stake if, if they're not following, um, following the, the restrictions as, as outlined by, by the city get all those points um, and I think that's also where our partnership with, with Department of Neighborhoods helps us make sure that we're we're communicating out in, in a broadly and accessibly accessible way um, the West Seattle blog is I think we all know just critical for for anything that's happening in in West Seattle and and uh, uh, Tracy was our first interview uh, with the media on this and and we'll look to having um, continuing that channel it's it I, I completely agree that it is essential that we get information about this both about the repair and about the ongoing mitigation and and uh, detours and stuff like that out as broadly as possible so that we can be successful um, our last slide and, and I know we've had a lot of this dialogue along the way but uh, really just about how um, how uh, we are structuring ourselves very quickly to tackle this. This is not something that falls within one, you know, one uh, work group within ESTA. It's really touching all of us very quickly. Um, folks know, uh, I think Heather Marks, who was instrumental in, in our success around the viaduct closure last year and bringing, you know, public information and uh, bringing together all the things that needed to happen from an ESTA uh, perspective. I've asked her to take the lead on coordinating all of the, the work that needs to happen with uh, West Seattle Bridge. Um, Matt, as you, you've heard from, is, is leading on the structural uh, aspects. Adiam, who you've heard from, is leading on the traffic management aspects. Uh, Dan Anderson, who's been um, leading a lot of our communication on the Del Ridge Multimodal Corridor, uh, Del Ridge uh, Rapid Ride in investments, um, and so no, has a lot of uh, 
ties and knowledge with, with community is, is leading on our public information. Um, and Emily Reardon, who's uh, uh, our deputy chief of staff, has been, is our agency liaison, uh, working with other agencies and bringing other people together very quickly. Uh, for you all on the council, uh, Shauna Larson, our council liaison, is also an, an invaluable resource for you in terms of channeling uh, questions or, or requests uh, through Shauna. She's tied in with this team as well. Um, and then uh, it, it, this is this is really just a, a, a critical. We all know this is a critical piece of work uh, that uh, is is where we've rapidly stood up this team uh, within the the context of our uh, public health response right now, our COVID response tied into all the emergency response that we're doing there. Uh, but then this will this will sort of live on as a structure that, that will guide us through this, this whole process. So uh, I just want to reinforce again that we are taking this incredibly, incredibly seriously and, and um, working to organize ourselves to be successful in, in uh, delivering um, on, on restoring the bridge. Uh, thank you so much, Director Zimbabwe, and to all the staff over at SDOT for joining us in short order to um, uh, do this presentation. Uh, before we uh, conclude, I know that um, uh, Councilmember Herbold has uh, um, another question about uh, next steps. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to her. And uh, she might actually be gearing up to ask the question that I was thinking about. So I'm not going to. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna um, ask my question until I hear what Councilmember Herbold has to say. Please, Councilmember Herbold, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Council President. Um, so, since uh, we are, I think, oh, great, the next step slides up. So, as it relates specifically to um, to to our next steps and um, to both the near term and um, the long term repairs, it would be really helpful to know. Um, how it is you intend to fund the short-term repairs um, as soon as possible, um, what SDOT can do to um, uh, address or identify which projects they can no longer afford to do so we can make these funds available, and whether or not council action is uh, needed, I, I am assuming it would, to authorize some shifting some resources and when will, when will we have more of a picture on that yeah so those are those are all good questions um yes there will be uh budget impacts on the whole of the sdot program in terms of um taking taking these steps and i think those will be those will be discussions that we need to have um uh, those likely we, we need to get a little bit of a better handle on what exactly the repair and uh, the, the sort of shoring and then repair options are. Uh, we expect that'll happen over the next few weeks and can have some more of that discussion. This is at the same time as we all know and recognize, I think um, uh, CBO Director uh, Ben Noble has been very clear about some of the, the challenges we're facing as a city in response to uh, in, in the economic response to, to COVID-19 as well. So um, I think there's a, there's a lot that will be coming around the, the, the budget and um, how this fits into all of that. And it'll be a, it'll be a dialogue that we will need to have. So I, I don't know, I have exact timing on that, but recognize that it will have to be uh, a, a key, uh, a, a, something that, that we engage on. The last, I just want to also, last year, um, you know, beyond where we are right now in terms of shoring and then repair, we also recognize that there's a need to start talking about what the long term is beyond even repair and, and have a, a similar to what we've been doing on the Ballard Bridge recently and, and other bridges where we have a little bit more uh, lead time on these types of discussions of having a real uh, in-depth, robust discussion of, of what our options are uh, Beyond beyond sort of the, the immediate near term situation that we we find ourselves in right now, so that's something that, that will come. That's not our immediate priority right now, but it's something that we need to start uh, doing as soon as we as soon as we possibly can as well. Great, thank you so much. And then in terms of uh, the next steps here, something that I um, still am missing in terms of a piece of information and would appreciate. Um, knowing what the department is thinking around this is sort of um, 
uh, timelines around some of those short-term solutions that you identified and of course the long-term solutions and can you give us a sense of when you know sort of the timeline of implementation or uh, processing related to to those two different sets of uh, solutions identified in the previous slides yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm still. You know, this is this is obviously taken us um, a little bit. You know, this is this accelerated faster than than we thought it would, and so I, I don't right now have a, a as much as information as I would like to have and be be talking about with you in terms of some of those things. Um, the and, and I think some of that will go hand in hand with what the budgetary impacts might be of either either the short or the long term, like these the the immediate and the the sort of midterm repair options i i do know that it's, it's not unfortunately it's not going to be a short duration uh, and i don't want to give the impression that this is something that we are going to handle uh within the next few weeks or something like that um we are working to do it as quickly as possible and to do all the things that we need to do um but it, it it's going to be something that uh, unfortunately i think will outlast the public health emergency that we find ourselves in right now, which is something, which is a reason why uh, we also need to be thinking proactively about what the traffic mitigations are as as things get back to a state of, of normalcy as well. So, Director Zimbabwe, as you sit here today, you and your staff can't give the city council um, any sort of sense of a timeline as it relates to the short-term goals and the long-term goals of repair. I, I think this, you know, a week after this, we made this decision to close the bridge. I, I, I am very reluctant to speculate on what those, uh, what those timelines are, uh, because I think um, at this point, if any range that I give would likely be, uh, would would likely have problems, and I, I just, I'm, I'm very reluctant to to even try to speculate on it because I, I, I think it'll put out a false sense that we have a better understanding of the path forward than we currently do. Um, I can appreciate that. We don't, we certainly don't want to, um, to uh, create timelines for ourselves that are not going to be realistic and that set a false expectation for um, people who rely on uh, the West Seattle Bridge for uh, moving about, whether it's people on buses or, um, or, or people in cars. But uh, I do think it's important for the city council to get a sense of what the process will be that the department is going to undertake to be able to get to a point where it has a, a, a high level of confidence in establishing the timeline, whether that's by phases or for the complete project, right? And I understand that we're only a week after um, the decision was made and it was made public uh, that there would be a full closure of the West Seattle Bridge. But I do think it's incumbent upon us to get a better understanding from you all at SDOT uh, what the process will look like for determining what uh, relevant timelines might be. Is yep. that something that the department can do? Yes, we can. We can do that. I think that it will be over the next month or so that we have a, a good, a better sense of where and what we need to do, um, uh, and and we start to put some of those actions in place at the same time. So uh, I, I'm very committed to sharing that uh, with with the council as we as we have more information about it, um, and I think you know the next three, four weeks are what we'll need to, to be able to come back with a bit better information and, and answers to all those questions. Um, I appreciate that. Um, that gives me a better sense of uh, what, sort of how long the process will take to evaluate timelines. And, and I think that that is helpful. So what I'm hearing from you is that in the next three to four weeks, you'll have a better sense of uh, what potential timelines could look like. What I would ask uh, of you um, now is is for a commitment to work with uh, Councilmember Herbold and Councilmember Peterson and my office and making sure that we are in tight communication around what that process is and what potential timelines uh, might look like as it relates to both the short-term strategies and the long-term strategies of um, of repair of the West Seattle Bridge. Is that is that something that you all could do? Absolutely. Great. 
Um, I don't have any other questions uh, at this time. Are there any of my other colleagues that have questions before I close out this presentation? Okay, I'm not hearing from anyone. I just wanted to um, really quickly thank SDOT for all of the, the quick work that you all did. I think, you know, obviously um, I expressed some frustration at the top of uh, the presentation as it relates to the timing of when notification was given to us, but I don't want that um, expression of frustration to, to minimize uh, the hard work that I know that SDOT is doing. I wanna especially thank Matt for, um, for his quick work in recognizing that um, this was a, a, a serious public safety issue uh, for the people of, um, of Seattle. And uh, I can only imagine um, sort of how uh, significant it was for Matt to undertake that, that, that decision uh, and to see what, what you saw in that moment with your own eyes uh, to be able to make that call and to do it quickly for the best interest of uh, all users of the West Seattle Bridge. I really just want to thank you, uh, Matt, for, um, for making that tough call and for doing the work that was necessary to make sure that we as a city acted quickly to preserve life and safety. Uh, I know that this is an inconvenience for many folks in West Seattle or people who come in and out of West Seattle, but at the end of the day, we have a paramount duty to preserve life and safety of those people who use or may use the West Seattle Bridge. And, um, and, uh, and I'm really proud of the work that SDOT did to, to step into action to do that. And so we're all gonna have to give just a little bit more um, amidst this crisis uh, to, to, um, to, to travel those additional five miles to get to where we need to get um, during this period of time and beyond. So th thank you all for, um, for your work and, and Matt, especially for, um, for all the work that you're doing on this as well. You're welcome. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and conclude this portion of our agenda. We can say goodbye to our um, SDOT folks. Thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate you. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and move through um, our agenda. We are running a little long today, but um, slated to be here until at least 1130. So hopefully we can get the reports of uh, today's uh, city council actions um, uh, done in about 30 minutes. So colleagues, we will go ahead and begin our next discussion on the preview of today's city council actions, council and regional committees. I'm gonna uh, once again, call on council members by district number, starting with district one and ending with the two city um, citywide positions eight and nine. So let's go ahead and start with uh, district one. And um, council member Herbold, I think you're, are you giving the report for council member Mosqueda as well? Um, I believe I am, but if I could do that at the, at the end, just so I can shift my pieces of paper. Stay in order. Yeah, got it. Yeah, of course. There you go. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So District 1, Councilmember Herbal, take it away. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so I have a couple of items um, on the agenda today. Uh, the first is Resolution 31939. Uh, this is a resolution in support of the bid by the City of Seattle to host the National League of Cities in 2025. Um, and it's a little surreal to <laughs> talk about uh, inviting um, a convention to the city of Seattle in the midst of these um, circumstances that we're living in. This is in 2025. It re-ups um, a previous um, resolution that the council passed. Just as a little bit of background, National League of Cities is the country's oldest, largest, and most representative organization serving municipal governments with a mission to strengthen and promote cities as centers of opportunity, leadership, and governance. We are, uh, the city of Seattle is a longtime member of the NLC and previously hosted this conference in 2013. Visit Seattle is preparing Seattle's bid, working in partnership with the Association of Washington Cities. The mayor has already signed a letter indicating her support for hosting the 2025 conference. And my office has previously circulated information to council members about the conference and its 
expected impact on Seattle, including answers to the checklist of questions required by resolution 30340 for special events that have might have uh, impacts on, on the city, financial impacts and otherwise. This is a, a piece of legislation um, that the council passed a couple years ago. Um, the, re the Today's uh, resolution declares the city council's support of Seattle's bid and invites the NLC to conduct a site visit here as it considers where to host. It's projected to be about 4,500 attendees with an estimated economic impact of about $13.8 million for the city of Seattle. Um, just as far as a little bit of in, uh, further background, in 2018, as I mentioned earlier, Councilmember Bagshaw sponsored and the council passed um, another resolution to support the hosting of the NLC conference in 2024 or 2025. Uh, the uh, Visit Seattle believes a new resolution that specifically identifies <laughs> 2025 as a target date um, will be required to ensure a more competitive bid for them. Uh, given that desire, I initiated the review process outlined in resolution 30340 to ensure that the city council is providing appropriate oversight Central staff reviewed the Visit Seattle request and has indicated that the conference meets the definition of a major event. Special permitting is unlikely to be required, and this event is unlikely to result in the trigger, triggering of a future obligation per the resolution to determine the city's financial exposure and resource commitment to the event. The threshold to trigger that obligation, which was not met is anticipated overtime expenditures 3% of Seattle Police Department's budget for overtime. Um, other items on the agenda today, um, we also have uh, resolution 31942. Um, this relates to the both the near term spending um, and the uh, mitigation costs for um, for both the, again the, the repair and mitigation during closure um, of the uh, of the West Seattle Bridge and basically adds the bridge to quarterly recording uh, reporting requirements. Um, Council Member Peterson might have more to add about this, but this adds this this uh, this project to our quarterly watch program, um, and that will enhance other efforts that the council is engaged in um, to uh, make sure that we are all as a body uh, well informed about the, the both the impacts to commuters, but also the impacts to the to the city budget and the need the possible need to make um, changes in other uh, SDOT program commitments in order to uh, facilitate the necessary uh, repair um, and necessary mitigation during the closure. A couple other things I wanted to mention. Um, I had received some um, some inquiries about the uh, police department's enforcement of the stay at home order. Um, there were some concerns raised um, at last Monday's uh, uh, council briefings meeting, and there was also some activity um, uh, online about concerns um, about how SPD, the Seattle Police Department, is going about enforcing the stay at home order. The chief clearly co communicated to me that they are not enforcing or stopping folks for being out and about. Um, SPD's role is education right now. The chief has all also clearly communicated that traffic and um, other stops should only occur um, if there is risk to the safety um, of folks driving vehicles or others. Um, the intent again is to limit exposure. So that relates specifically to traffic stops. Um, the chief has been messaging to the public um, who have directly contacted her as well, that if this happens, as with all concerns about p police behavior, um, they really uh, rely on receiving details of those of those experiences. Um, and um, if an individual officer is um, taking actions that are not authorized by the the current policies around enforcement of stay at home orders, um, that the chief is committed to um, to looking into those those complaints, and she has made it very clear again that this is not the operational policy of the department. 
I have two amendments to two of the bills that are coming up later on today. I think in the interest of time, they're um, small, I, I think mostly technical amendments. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold my comments on those. Those already have been circulated. Um, one relates to the, um, the ordinance uh, uh, for the uh, grocery vouchers and the other uh, relates specifically to the ordinance um, allowing the city to um, accept gifts. Um, again, those are those uh, those small amendments are in your in your inboxes, and we can talk about them more at two o'clock today. Uh, lastly, I just want to mention that um, one of the events I'm participating in this week is a virtual meeting and presentation to D the District One Community Network about my committee work plan and priorities for this year. That's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. Uh, any questions for Councilmember Herbold? Okay, hearing none, we're gonna go ahead and move on. Uh, Councilmember Morales had to get off the call as she told us earlier. Uh, did she give a report to anyone? Okay, looks like she didn't. So we're, we'll go ahead and go straight to Councilmember Sawant on uh, uh, District 3, please. Thank you, Council President Gonzalez. Uh, there are no items on today's City Council meeting agenda from the Sustainability and Renters' Rights Committee. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the committee is on Tuesday, April 28th at 2 p.m., although that will, of course, depend on what happens with the council committee meeting schedule this coming month and with how the coronavirus crisis evolves in the coming weeks. My office is planning to host a virtual town hall meeting this Thursday, April 2nd. We are setting up the technology now and I will send out more details along with links to participate once they are ready. As I had stretched, stressed last week, the coronavirus is, uh, crisis is creating economic devastation, which is compounding the suffering caused by the illness itself. And uh, of course, the families who have lost their loved ones, coworkers who have lost their coworkers, friends who've lost their friends. And we cannot hope to address the crisis with uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul approach, sacrificing one vitally important social program to fund another. That is why Councilmember Morales and I are proposing, as uh, I'm sure you all have heard, a $500 million a year big business tax to raise significant funds to address the immediate COVID related needs of working class people, and then to have the tax continue into the future as a public jobs program building affordable social housing and for Green New Deal aspects. We will be unveiling the legislation publicly uh, early this week, and I hope to have conversations with other council members about it. The legislation, as I'm sure we will all agree, even if there's not agreement on the legislation itself, is that it's a result of a grassroots movement that my council office has been helping to build and lead for nearly three years, especially in the last several months. I have, uh, uh, just to let all my colleagues know, I have left a request to Council President Gonzalez that I be allowed to chair the committee where this legislation will be discussed, either in my Sustainability and Renters Rights Committee or in a separate select committee chaired by me so that the movement can continue to have a voice. Uh, as I have said to the Council President, it's not acceptable to me that this legislation is, uh, given its significance, is uh, not in a committee chaired by me, uh, of course, in the past, I have uh, not had objections to having my legislation being discussed in uh, committees chaired by other council members because it's a question of uh, where we think are in terms of winning and what the role needs to be for the movement. And in this case, I think it's extremely necessary unless council members announce that they are supporting this legislation, uh, in which case I will uh, you know, greatly welcome that. But in the absence of that, I would really urge that the movement have a clear and direct voice by allowing my office to chair the committee. I've also offered to co-chair such a committee and I'm happy to do that and I'm happy to discuss those options. And I look forward to continuing that conversation with Council Member, Council President Gonzalez. Finally, but not least, I would like to express solidarity with all the Instacart workers, Instacart shoppers who are really workers in the gig workers collective who are on strike today courageously across the country. Uh, Instacart has exploited the coronavirus pandemic for their own profits on top of the normal exploitation of the shoppers that has been happening for years and has provided the people who do the work 
with almost no safety equipment or decent pay. It's quite incredible. The workers have been asking for weeks for s simple things like hand sanitizer sprays and wipes, which the company has refused to pay. This is the same story at the Amazon uh, delivery stations as well, the Amazon cargo handlers and the delivery drivers have re reported that they won't even get hand sanitizers for their truck. So it's really important that Instacart shoppers are going on strike uh, hopefully there will be at least 150 to 200,000 of them participating in the nationwide strike today. In the days leading up to the strike, Instacart, you know, because they're nervous about the strike, did make small concessions like promising to provide hand sanitizer, but it should be recognized as a victory for the movement. And it shows that collective action by workers can win. Today, their strike demands are safety precautions at no cost to workers, all the uh, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, including hand sanitizer, but beyond that, hazard pay, which is an extra $5 uh, per order and defaulting the in-app tip amount uh, to at least 10% of the order total, an extension and expansion of pay for workers impacted by COVID-19. Anyone who has a doctor's note for either a pre-existing condition that's a known risk factor or requiring a self-quarantine. And the, their fourth demand is a deadline to qualify for these benefits must be extended beyond April 8th. So, uh, I just wanted to use this opportunity to express my solidarity with them and also share with the council that yesterday I had the privilege of interviewing one of the main strike leaders, Vanessa Bain. And I will be sharing that video soon through our council Facebook page. Thank you. Great. Thank you um, so much, uh, Councilmember Sawant. We're going to go ahead. Any questions for Councilmember uh, Sawant? Okay, hey, hearing none, we're gonna go ahead and move over to District 4. Councilmember Peterson, the floor is yours. Good morning. It's nice to see everybody. I miss you all. Um, for everybody who's viewing uh, this council briefing, just a reminder that even though you're, you're hearing about specific initiatives and programs and proposals, uh, we, the seattle.gov websites have great resources there right now. Uh, Seattle, go to www.seattle.gov uh, for the mayor's COVID-19 resources. And the city council has its own website, thanks to the work of all the council staff who put it together at seattle.gov uh, backslash council. That's very important list of existing resources for folks. So on this afternoon's full city council agenda, there are no items directly from the transportation and utilities committee. Our committee normally meets on the first and third Wednesdays of each month. However, there are no committee meetings scheduled at this time as we respond to COVID-19 public health crisis. Thank you to Council President Gonzalez and her dedicated team for working with the chairs of the various committees to prioritize our workloads. We are hearing, as Councilmember Herbold mentioned, a, a resolution 31942, which she and I worked on together to uh, add the West Seattle Bridge to the watch list of capital projects now that it's become a major capital project so we can give it the um, very intense oversight it warrants. Another transportation issue, um, uh, we listened last week, took action to meet the transportation needs of hospital workers to stay healthy and maintain social distancing when they drive to their jobs. Last week, I announced with Mayor Durkin free on-street parking around hospitals and testing sites for health care workers. There were various parking restrictions around these uh, around hospitals, which have been relaxed. Uh, the uh, Seattle Department of Transportation worked with the police department and the Department of Construction and Inspections to make this happen. I want to thank them so that we prioritize transportation options for our brave health care workers who are on the front lines of this crisis. District 4, um, for those watching today who live in East Lake, Wallingford, or Northeast Seattle, please continue to support, support small businesses in our District 4 by ordering takeout meals at the local restaurants. Last week, I went to Uncle Lee's on Sandpoint Way to get takeout for our family. I hope if you're able to do that, I encourage that to support those small businesses. Uh, although our team is working remotely during this crisis, um, we are still having our office hours. Please schedule office hours by phone. They've been very successful. I had to talk to several people this past Friday afternoon. Just email us at alex.peterson at seattle.gov. Uh, that's P-E-D with like district and E-R-S-E-N 
and that E is the missing E from Wedgwood. Um, so we are uh, on the council agenda today is the um, um, resolution from Councilmember Morales uh, about evictions and the moratorium on foreclosures. Um, look forward to discussing that at full council today. Also, Councilmember uh, Mosqueda had circulated a letter, which is complementary to that resolution. It, it zeroes in on asking the governor to uh, have a ban on foreclosures during the crisis. Uh, it's really the other side of the equation when we talk about evictions. We also need to consider foreclosures so that banks are not foreclosing on the the uh, folks providing housing or providing commercial space. Um, so, you know, as somebody who worked at financial institutions, let me say this to the banks, do the decent thing, banks, do not foreclose. And just to make sure you do the right thing, we're asking our governor to ban bank foreclosures during this public health and economic crisis. You've all seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. We're asking banks to be like the character Jimmy Stewart played and not like the one played the Mr. Potter character who was always foreclosing. So please do the right thing. Thanks. Thank you very much. Oh, and uh, may I read Councilmember Juarez's notes? Uh, yes, uh, you can. Um, actually, before you do that, if that concludes your report, Councilmember Peterson, then I want to open it up and let folks ask you any questions about your report before we move on to Councilmember Juarez. I had some comments. Okay, Councilmember Salant. It's really uh, in relation to the resolution from Councilmember Morales, but since it was mentioned, I thought I'll uh, jump in and just say that uh, just to just uh, for anybody who is listening at this moment uh, outside of the city council itself, the resolution calls for a moratorium on uh, rent payments and mor mortgage payments, which is a step ahead of and very necessary step ahead of what. Uh, our movement pushed for and won through the mayor's executive order that was voted by, on by the council for the uh, eviction moratorium and foreclosure moratorium. I think this is, it's important that uh, rent payments and mortgage payments are suspended. And also we're calling for utility payments also to be suspended through the end of this crisis because many people have been laid off. They have lost their wages. In fact, the Department of Labor announced that overall at least over 3 million people nationwide have been have lost their jobs in the just in the last week and this is through using the unemployment insurance filings as the measure which we know is a regularly an underestimate because many part-time workers don't qualify gig economy workers don't qualify self-employed people who are also workers don't qualify so we know that by that measure the uh, number of people who have lost their jobs in washington state is well above what is announced by the Department of Labor, which is over 133,000. So we should imagine that roughly 150 to 200,000 workers are bereft right now. And we know that the majority of America lives paycheck to paycheck. And so there's no way that many of these people are going to be able to pay their rent. And in the case of homeowning workers uh, and also struggling small businesses, they're not going to be able to pay their uh, rent or mortgage. And that's why it's important to call for uh, suspending both. And I s support this resolution. And in fact, before this resolution was announced, actually my office had launched a petition uh, uh, urging the governor to uh, statewide call for a suspension of rent, mortgage, and utility payments. And also the petition additionally calls for a rent freeze, meaning no increases in the monthly rent through the end of 2020. And what's stunning is that we had to include that in the petition because we are hearing from people around the state that corporate landlords are so blood sucking that in the middle of the pandemic, they are sending rent increase notices to the tenants for, you know, in a couple of months from now. So that's just uh, unconscionable. And we want to make sure that there's a suspension of rent and mortgage payments and a rent freeze, meaning no increasing in the increases in the monthly rent announced through uh, the end of 2020. And I wanted to share that our petition has gathered uh, well over 6,000 signatures and it will continue to gather it as, as we speak. The signatures are, are rolling in and, uh, and, and I'm really excited about this. And in fact, we are not alone. Actually, there's a petition in Ohio, for example, that has gathered over 115,000 signatures. So people are in crisis uh, throughout the nation, including in Washington state. And it's incredibly important that 
steps are taken, it's March 30th, you know, April 1st to April 5th, rent is going to be due and people are going to be in crisis immediately. So I would really urge uh, a quick passage of this resolution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Council Member um, Salant and Council Member Peterson uh, for those remarks. Um, I do on the resolution that is being sponsored by uh, Council Member Morales, which I support. I just want to clarify because we've been receiving some emails and social media uh, traffic on this issue. That there seems to be a misunderstanding about what the resolution will accomplish. The resolution will um, uh, create a statement of legislative record that we support the governor and encourage the governor to take this action as it relates to uh, stopping foreclosure and uh, the um, increases of rent. Some individuals who are advocating for this seem to think that passage of this resolution will in effect uh, freeze rents and stop rent increases and stop um, foreclosures. And I just wanna make really clear to the public that that is not what this resolution will accomplish. Uh, when it is passed um, this afternoon. So I just want to really make sure that we're not sending out a, a false sense of expectation to the general public about what this resolution will accomplish both for the city of Seattle and, um, and statewide. All right, Councilmember Peterson, you want to uh, provide, uh, provide the report for Councilmember Juarez? Yes, thank you. So because I'm the vice chair of the committee that Councilmember Juarez chair she's asked me to read her council briefing notes uh, the first one's about sound transit so last thursday council member juarez attended the board of directors meeting of sound transit and sound transit staff made it possible for members to participate remotely and they discussed several items such as covid 19 impacts on our transit system and our ongoing policy discussions around fair enforcement reform council member uh, Juarez wants to thank the many individuals who contacted her about the importance of sound transit investing in a pilot project that services low-income riders, as well as the importance of separating sound transit's fair enforcement protocols from the complications of our court system. So while uh, Councilmember Juarez wholeheartedly stands with this message and advocated for these improvements, um, she's they've decided to delay the major policy vote to a later time to allow more attention to respond to COVID-19 impacts. Uh, she's got a parks update uh, because parks is in her committee and the Department of Parks and Recreation, as we know, they temporarily closed some parking lots uh, throughout the city and uh, at parks to discourage people from traveling to the parks and, and to maintain social distancing protocols so there were some additional parks, parking lots closed, uh, specifically on Lake Washington Boulevard to help limit the amount of people congregating in parking lots and at park sites. Um, uh, Councilmember Juarez uh, is continuing to assess these closures to ensure they are addressing social distancing concerns and not having any unintended consequences. Uh, these parking lots are Pritchard Beach, Ferdinand, Duck Bay, Adams Street, 49th Street, Stan Sayers, Mount Baker, Coleman Park, and Day Street. And these measures are not meant to prohibit individuals from using the parks, but just to dovetail with the recent closures at other parking lots across the city uh, that service parks. Uh, Councilmember Juarez wanted to talk a little bit about the hand washing stations, though I imagine um, some other council members might be talking about that as well, especially Councilmember Lewis. Uh, Briefly, uh, Mayor Durkin announced the deployment of 14 uh, toilets and uh, six hand washing stations near impact areas, high impact encampment areas throughout Seattle. One of those does include near the Lake City Community Center in District 5. These facilities are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. and daily maintenance will be provided. And that is Councilmember Juarez's report. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson, for doing that. Uh, okay, so I think Councilmember Strauss is doing the tour. Did he leave a report with anyone? Looks like uh, looks like he did not. So we will move on to uh, District Seven. Councilmember Lewis, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Council President Gonzalez. First off, can everyone hear me? I haven't talked yet, so I want to make sure my mic is working. I see nodding from from uh, everybody. Okay, great. Um, so. Uh, just, just to start, nothing from the select committee on uh, homelessness on the council agenda this afternoon. 
Um, I do want to take a moment to recognize, as uh, Council uh, Member Peterson just did, um, the deployment of the additional hygiene facilities to provide resources to our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Um, the 14 toilets, six hand washing stations, uh, there's going to be soon deployed uh, four hygiene trailers with showers, toilets, hand washing stations. I um, want to also note that the navigation team has distributed 600 hygiene kits um, to folks who are experiencing homelessness to make sure people have the resources to adequately maintain hygiene um, in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, I'm also grateful for the 1,900 additional transitional shelter spaces that have been stood up. Um, uh, my committee, uh, and I know I've, I've talked to a number of colleagues about this, uh, is interested in looking into how many of these transitional spaces we can hang on to and protect uh, on the other side of this outbreak, given that we will still have a state of emergency on homelessness uh, when COVID-19 um, uh, is no longer um, an exigent issue. Uh, some of those 1900 spaces I would note uh, include the transitional encampments um, that uh, had been budgeted to be stood up um, by this council in the last um, uh, cycle. And I'm proud to say that uh, the South Lake Union um, uh, encampment in my district has been expanded as one of those sites. And, and I believe additional sites are being stood up um, by Lehigh and I'm very grateful for that uh, response. Um, I do uh, want to say that on the introduction referral calendar unrelated to um, the Select Committee on Homelessness, uh, I have put forward a resolution um, on uh, creating a work group to come up with some uh, recommendations around uh, performance auditing. This was a big issue that I talked about during my campaign. I know that a number of folks on this council um, have a, a long and well-established interest in the audit function of our department. I think it's often forgotten uh, by the general public that uh, you know, the Office of the Auditor is a legislative branch um, position. Uh, it is a, uh, a very impactful office that has done significant work in making sure that the uh, ordinances of this council are um, carried out in an efficacious way. Uh, that there is response from the executive branch to the, the requests and the desires of the council, and that the money that we as a council um, budget and approve is being um, spent effectively to realize the goals, the policy goals that we as a council put forward. So I look forward to having that conversation as that um, resolution develops and look forward to having more conversations one-on-one -on -one, um, about that over the coming weeks. Um, I do also, uh, to echo Councilmember Peterson's comments, I look forward to the discussion um, on Councilmember Morales' resolution on um, the moratorium on rent and mortgages. Um, I, I do agree, and, and it, it, uh, the actor that played Mr. Potter, uh, Councilmember Peterson, um, uh, Lionel Barrymore, uh, I want to echo your comments that I think that all of our bankers need to aspire to be like Lionel Barrymore in You Can't Take It With You, not Lionel Barrymore in It's a Wonderful Life. This is critical and important. I agree with you. Uh, and I uh, want to make sure that in this moment of crisis, we don't have anybody being foreclosed on, being forced out in the street. We really need to make sure that we are leading on this as a council, as a nation, um, at all levels of government. And I think that that resolution is a good step in the right direction. Uh, Moving on to uh, the last thing that I want to touch on um, before concluding the report. Um, I know it's hard to focus on this given everything else that's going on um, as a city and as a country. But, uh, you know, the other day when I when I took my um, uh, my daily outside of my apartment activity of getting my mail, uh, I went downstairs uh, and noticed in the bin where junk mail was thrown out, you know, folks asking you to sign up for a credit card or unsanctioned advertisements, coupons, um, there was an alarming number of census cards um, that had been thrown into that bin with all of the junk mail. I want to make a quick plea here at briefing for all of you watching, go and fill out the census. Um, it is extremely easy. It is extremely important for us as a city and as a region 
that we be adequately represented, that folks go online, they fill out the census and they get their information in. It's very simple, just go to my 2020 census, 2020 spelled out in, um, in numbers, not letters, my2020census.gov, all one word. Um, it's critical for the future of our democracy since congressional, delegate to congressional districts and legislative districts are gonna be drawn based on the numbers in the census. So for the city of Seattle to get our adequate share of representation in Washington DC and in Olympia, it is critical that you go online and make it clear uh, uh, that, that you live here in the city of Seattle. Um, it's critical for our share of federal money for all of the projects that we uh, feel really um, uh, deeply for and that we feel a, a really deep need for. Um, I mean, just to give a couple of examples, SNAP funds, free and reduced lunch, Medicaid, Head Start programs, uh, community mental health, uh, the um, uh, the West Seattle Bridge that we talked about earlier, infrastructure spending. Um, all of these uh, um, funds are distributed by the federal government and, and by the state government in part proportional to representation and population. So it is just critical for you, those of you watching at home, the census is important. I know there's a lot going on right now but make sure you go online um, to my2020census.gov and make sure that you're heard, make sure that you're counted, it's important. Um, and with that, uh, Madam President, I don't have any further uh, remarks. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis. Are there any uh, questions or comments um, for Councilmember Lewis? Councilmember Herbold, please. Hand raising. It's so nice, yeah, I can see you all raising your hands. It makes it a little easier, go for it. Thank you so much. Um, Councilmember Lewis, thank you for making the plug um, about the census. Um, I had similar thoughts um, and anxiety um, uh, around uh, people being distracted uh, from uh, carrying out this very important civic function. So I really appreciate you uh, raising the importance. Um, Councilmember Lewis, I have a question about um, part of your report related to specifically um, the hand washing stations and uh, the public bathrooms. Um, those are uh, those are located in six locations throughout the city. Um, so the 14 bathrooms are um, in some cases um, there that it just means that there are two bathrooms at a single location. There are there are only to my knowledge to my understanding six locations um, throughout the city. And I'm getting um, some conflicting information um, about the executive's intent to expand that beyond the six locations. And I'm just wondering, um, on one hand, I, I have heard that, they're, um, that they are considering um, additional locations, but I'm not really clear on the process or the timing um, on that. And I'm just wondering um, whether or not um, you've heard um, from from the executive about the the long term plan around this really really important um, need uh, for our, our our unhoused population. Um, we have a COVID nineteen crisis on our hands. Um, we don't want other public health emergencies to arise um, because of communicable diseases that could be spread from. Um, lack of access to, to bathrooms, um, even though we don't have um, as many public restrooms as we would like in the city, the fact that so many public buildings have been closed and so many businesses are closed is really having a, a profound impact on the ability of our unsheltered population um, to access basic hygiene. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Herbal, um, for that question. You know, I share the, the same commitment that um, so many of us on the council share in making sure that we stand up these hygiene facilities. Um, it was one of our specifically enumerated, all the way back at the, the beginning of this crisis, one of our specifically enumerated requests in our um, resolution to the executive at the beginning that these uh, locations be stood up. Um, at this time, um, I don't have any additional information about additional sites that are planned. It is one of the things that um, upon hearing about this, um, the confirmation of the sites that are being stood up uh, that I asked the executive um, last Friday. Um, I haven't uh, heard a response from that yet, but you know things are moving very quickly. It's one of the things on my agenda today to, to circle back on. Um, and it is important and I know it's a priority for all of us as a council. 
Thank you, Councilmember Lewis. It was really, uh, I appreciate your following up. I look forward to hearing more. It was very difficult for me uh, to both applaud the standing up of the, these six locations um, while also being really disappointed that there are so few um, when the need is so great. So I really appreciate um, your focus on this issue as well. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Herbold, for highlighting that in particular. I know um, a lot of us have been doing a lot of work in this space for many years and um, and sort of share um, your conflicting sentiment there as it relates to this issue. So I appreciate that. Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and move along. Uh, we are now going to hear from Councilmember Herbold. I believe you have the report for uh, Councilmember Mosqueda in position eight. I do. Uh, Councilmember Mosqueda had asked that I report on two pieces of legislation that are on the uh, full council agenda today for consideration. Um, the first is Council Bill 119763, um, and this relates specifically to the goal of being able to, to quickly deploy resources from private donations or grants quickly to provide COVID-19 relief to our communities. Um, this will um, uh, relax some requirements that are typically in place for uh, the deployment of resources from private do donations or grants. Um, but Councilmember Mosqueda I, I notes that while uh, relaxing these requirements, it's really important to have transparency and oversight in how we are allocating those dollars. Um, as a council, it's important that we understand the full picture of dollars going to support various needs, such as small business support, food assistance, homelessness supports, et cetera, and that we're able to make informed decisions about other expenditures. She has an amendment um, to this bill that would require weekly reporting on how these funds are being spent so that we are able to maintain pro proper oversight um, and that we can enable expedient direction of these funds to where they are most needed in the community. Um, earlier, I mentioned that I had an amendment to this bill. Uh, my amendment is actually um, an amendment to hers. Hopefully it will be considered a friendly amendment. And it simply um, adds to um, her reporting requirement um, that we also include the categories of use as described um, as the permissible uses um, in the resolution itself. The second piece of legislation that Councilmember Mosqueda is sponsoring and that she also has uh, an amendment for is Council Bill 119764, uh, which creates a new uh, $5 million uh, grocery voucher program in the Office of Sustainability and Environment to support uh, 6,250 low-income families facing food insecurity because of the response to COVID-19. The program itself is funded with sugary beverage tax revenues. Due to the crisis we are in, we've um, decided to reallocate some of the funds that were going to parks in the Department of Neighborhoods. The Community Advisory Board for the Sugary Beverage Fund is supportive of the reallocation of the funds. And due to the large number of layoffs um, during COVID-19, we need to really make sure that we're getting uh, families food um, at this at this really crisis time um, that can increase food insecurity. Councilmember Muscada notes that she's honored that these dollars are being used at a union grocery store where workers are receiving stronger supports and resources to perform their various central services. Um, and um, she wants me to note that she um, uh, has has this honor as somebody who has worked in labor and public health for over a decade. Um, she's heard a lot from employers um, uh, to that they are defending the minimum wage um, and that um, they uh, defend health insurance because um, these are un, uh, these are entry level jobs and um, that this is this is uh, something that I think employers um, might have a diverging opinions um, about, but right now we are seeing that janitors, custodial services, LPNs, home care workers, grocery workers, nurses, uh, residents, and doctors in training and doctors are so essential. Um, I think that is really important to, um, to hold um, as we consider um, during this time of crisis 
the um, commitment that we have as a city to uh, worker standards, and they are so com so essential to keep our committee from collapse. Um, many of these folks are doing so for very low wages. And um, she makes a note that when this is over, she hopes that we take time to pay and respect um, all of these workers for what they're doing and what they've done for us during this crisis. And I just want to flag, um, I have an amendment to this bill that requests that OSE pursue partnerships beyond Safeway with additional retailers with a preference for those that are also unionized to expand retail operations for households receiving emergency grocery vouchers. Um, I've heard uh, from constituents who have contacted me about the hope that we can expand this beyond Safeway. And that is the end of Councilmember Mosqueda's report. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Herbold. I will, we will go ahead and move on to um, the final report for today, which is my report. So uh, Councilmember Herbold uh, touched on it a little bit via Councilmember Mosqueda's um, amendment to Council Bill 11963. That's agenda item one, a bill that I am the primary sponsor for, uh, as described by Councilmember Herbold. Um, my apologies. Is <laughs> oh no, that's okay. That's all right. Um, it is a it's a bill that's designed to allow for philanthropic and cor corporate partners to donate resources to assist people and businesses in need. Uh, Article one, section one of the city charter provides that the city of Seattle may accept gifts and donations of all kinds and do all acts necessary to care out that uh, the purposes of the gifts and donations. Uh, we do have some language in the Seattle Municipal Code that allows during a civil emergency period, the mayor to accept gifts, grants, or loans uh, with the council considering appropriate legislation to allow for that acceptance. So this legislation effectuates um, that uh, uh, language in our charter and our municipal code by creating a new fund in the city treasurer for receipt of gifts, donations, and grants to the city to assist in the management of and recovery from this crisis. I'll go into a greater detail detail um, about what the bill will accomplish um, at two o'clock during the full council, but it's a pretty straightforward piece of legislation. A lot of people have been asking, how can I help? How can I get engaged? Um, and there's a lot of uh, nonprofits that have established um, relief funds. Um, there are some labor unions who've established some uh, worker relief funds, and um, and now this is the city's opportunity to create a similar relief fund opportunity to supplement some of the work that we're doing um, in this space. And of course, we get contacted by many private interests who want to give uh, gifts or contributions to the city of Seattle as we look at um, our work around, um, around uh, uh, meeting the needs created by this crisis. And this is our tool to be able to, uh, to do that. So really excited about being able to sponsor that legislation and do consider the amendments that are gonna be put forward at 2 p.m. as uh, friendly amendments to um, that legislation. Um, secondly, I would say that um, that uh, we uh, last Friday, I believe, received uh, an, an additional executive order from Mayor Durkin related to providing emergency child care to first responders and other essential workers uh, throughout the city. Uh, we are in the process of evaluating that executive order. Um, as the chair of the committee responsible for education, I take very seriously the need to make sure that the proposed uh, um, repurposing of the of the FEP levy dollars is um, is within the purview of uh, the ordinance, even in light of a, of a declared civil emergency related to this particular issue. So I'm working closely with Council Central staff and have been in communication for the past week with the executive uh, talking about the proposal and uh, the funding source. So obviously very supportive of the desire to provide childcare to essential workers and uh, really appreciate that the um, uh, uh, services will be provided not just to firefighters, not just to police officers, but to grocery workers and others who are also being required to uh, continue to go to work um, uh, as essential workers. So we'll, we'll, we'll be able to hopefully close the loop sometime this week. And if a resolution is necessary on the issue, that resolution will be considered on Monday, April 6th, but stay tuned and watch your inboxes for additional information about that um, executive order. Uh, lastly, I will say that um, we have started a um, story bank to collect stories related to uh, our council bills um, 
um, to um, create an additional eviction defense for COVID um, uh, related economic um, issues for not being able to pay rent as well as um, creating a pathway for tenants and landlords to enter into a written agreement to come up with a payment plan um, if they if tenants fall behind on the rent as a result of uh, losing um, their job or uh, income as a result of COVID-19 uh, business closures. So we, we are excited that we were able to launch that effort last Friday. And we are um, asking folks to share their stories with us of how they are engaging with their landlords or how their landlords are engaging with them um, in, by emailing us their stories to see as in uh, Corona, D as in diagnosis, uh, 19 underscore rent at seattle.gov. You can also go to our um, social media uh, handles at CML Gonzalez, that's with a Z at the end of Gonzalez to um, find a link for a Google document where you can submit those stories as well. So we really think it's important for us to make sure that we're building a good legislative record here. And part and parcel of that is to hear directly from people who are being negatively impacted by uh, the rental market and who are experiencing significant um, economic uh, issues as a result of having um, to, um, for example, lose their job and go on unemployment as a result of their business being closed. Um, because of the pandemic. So really excited about about um, about being able to launch this effort and looking forward to, to reading many of the stories that I'm sure will be shared with us. Happy to answer any questions. Council Member Herbold. Um, not a question, but I uh, appreciate this opportunity to um, share with um, the viewing public um, because of your remarks. I, I, I'm reminded um, one of the things that we're hearing uh, from landlords is concern um, about uh, not being able to access the city and the state's um, eviction prevention resources. And I have recently confirmed with the mayor's office, um, because we have an eviction moratorium in place that prohibits landlords from um, from issuing eviction notices, there has been there is a difficulty um, under our current programs to access uh, rent assistance. Previously, rent assistance could only be accessed if you have an eviction notice. Mm -hmm. um, and so the executive is changing um, those requirements um, to um, allow tenants to access the eviction resources, um, I'm sorry, the uh, rent assistance resources if they have a bill. So as we are uh, making it, um, uh, uh, addressing the needs of, of tenants under um, this really difficult economic crisis, um, I really wanna just thank the executive for working to um, address some of the needs of small landlords. Um, I wanna thank you also, council member, Council President uh, Gonzalez for your uh, creation of the time uh, payment plans. Um, it's similar to a bill that I have um, on the referral calendar today related to uh, the, uh, the commercial moratorium. I think it's really important that um, within the context of rent moratoriums, whether or not you're talking about residential rent moratoriums or commercial rent moratoriums, that we, cr we create a path that's somewhere between not paying the rent at all or having to pay all the rent. And I think these time payment programs um, creates that path mm -hmm. for people who can contribute some money to their rent um, as they move forward. Um, I also appreciate obviously that this, that your legislation um, also helps people uh, once we get outside of the COVID-19 um, crisis. Um, and then lastly, uh, really love the idea um, of collecting stories. I think that is, um, that is not only useful uh, for the legislative foundation um, of, of the policy that we're creating, um, but it's really important just to highlight um, sort of what the what the practices are and what some of the better practices are. We read today um, of the um, the North Seattle mobile home park landlord who um, is showing a great deal of flexibility with 
um, the residents there. I've, I've also, I've, I've, I've heard a number of similar stories, personal friends who are sending me the notes that they receive from their landlords of mm -hmm. real um, expressions of, of grace in this difficult time. I've also heard, um, unfortunately, um, of landlords raising the rents for all the tenants in their buildings um, out of an assumption that some tenants will be able to pay the increased rents because it's a building that is mixed income, has high income earners, as well as low income earners. This landlord is assuming that the low income earners are going to use um, the opportunities created by the eviction moratorium and not pay their rent, but by um, assessing large um, rent increases to all tenants in the building this particular landlord is hoping to make up the difference from his higher income tenants. So I think it's really important that we get all of these stories out, the good, bad, and the ugly. So thank you for creating the, the ability to do that. And I'm going to let the person who has reported this particular instance to me know about this opportunity because they are concerned about being public uh, um, about this unfortunate um, practice. Oh, and I and I appreciate that. I think um, I couldn't agree more and sort of echo those comments and really appreciate um, the support of all of you as my colleagues as we continue to collect these stories to make sure that we um, have a full holistic understanding of what is happening out there in the rental market during this um, this crisis. So really, really appreciate it. And uh, Councilmember Herbold, I know that you have um, that bill uh, related to commercial rent moratorium on our introduction referral calendar. We didn't have an opportunity to talk about that and we're close to noon at this point, um, but look forward to learning more about what you envision to be the process, the legislative process um, in terms of timing for consideration of that bill. Um, you know, we're hoping uh, to be able to consider our bill sometime in April um, and think it's a, your, your bill is obviously a good complement to the work that we're doing um, in addition to a good compliment to the letter and the resolution, the letter to the governor and the resolution uh, to the governor encouraging not just a relief for renters, but also for um, homeowners who are going to be faced with um, uh, mortgages and, and mortgage payments being due here pretty soon. Um, and, you know, make no mistake, uh, there are a significant number of people who are now on the rolls of um, unemployment benefits who are going to be seeing only partial wage replacement. Many of those homes, whether they're rented or um, or mortgaged, uh, are people who are currently experiencing um, unemployment, some for the first time in their lives. And so I think it's really important for us to make sure that we are looking at the full spectrum of who is going to be feeling the crunch of the economic crisis as it relates to housing costs. Okay, any other comments from my colleagues? Okay, hearing none. I just wanna, before we conclude, that's the end of our agenda. I really wanna thank our um, technology folks, Ian and Eric and others for um, making video conferencing possible for us. Thank you all to the, to the technology folks in the legislative department. And of course, thanks to our um, council central, excuse me, our um, clerk's office and uh, to uh, Tom, um, Mike Self from Council Central staff who was on the line available to answer any questions, but there weren't any uh, substantive questions um, on, uh, on any of the amendments or bills that we will be um, hearing. So thank you to everyone who was on the call today and it was really good to see your all's faces. We will see you at 2 p.m. We are adjourned. <laughs>